We will begin the program with the national anthem followed by the lighting of the oil lamp. At the crucial times we believe is a necessity. While there has been a certain level of adaptability in the way the education system has responded to the pandemic in the form of, for example, online platforms, we have come to understand that in the face of this new normal, education must be redefined. And for this, we require the heads of schools and institutes to come together so that we may begin the discussion of how best to move forward. Learning, assessment, qualifications, national qualifications framework. We need young Sri Lankan students to be as good as anybody else anywhere in the world because it's a global environment. So it's about careers uh, guidance. And then finally, the delivery models. You can't replace face to face. So some thoughts there. Next. Ah, yes. <laughs> oh, happy days, the days of a job for life. Can anybody remember those days? Not anymore. Yeah, welcome to the world of portfolio careers. Um, what we know is the world of work is changing. Um, well, the British Council has carried out a lot of research over the last few years, and one of them is looking at uh, languages, communication, English, in relation to employment. And what, what becomes clear is that what employers are looking for are not always what <laughs> education providers think they are. And it's less the technical skills, and it's more those core skills, 21st century skills, employability skills, whatever you want to call them. But those issues around problem solving, collaborative working, creativity, innovation, um, IT numeracy is also useful. But these are the things, these are the things employers are looking for, and we do our best to link the curriculum to the world of work. Whether it's through the materials, we maths, I was useless at maths. So if somebody told me it was about planning a budget to go on holiday, then I was really good at adding. <laughs> How much money do I need for the flight? Um, the other thing, as education providers, it helps if we understand the labour market. You know, what are the opportunities? I mean, the, the tourism sector globally has just crashed. So are there alternatives? If you have transferable skills, there are. <laughs> so, yeah, what's the world of work like? Um, a skills gap, uh, that, that's very often given by um, employers as a problem. And I go back to pedagogy. If you have learner-centered outcomes, you tend to select a particular pedagogy, and that type of pedagogy emphasizes those core skills of collaborative working, problem solving, and so on. So all of the things employers say they're looking for are in your, in your pedagogy, they're in your curriculum. So let's make sure they are there. The other thing is this challenge, and this is global, of people seeing vocational training as being of less value. Now, for me, vocational and academic pathways can both go to postgraduate degree level, because that's about the complexity of learning, um, learning outcomes, uh, knowledge packets. It's more about the pedagogy and the assessment. One is more academic, the other is more experiential and hands-on, but they are of equal esteem. We need to get children, young people, back face to face. You can't replace it, can you? And why is it so important? It's part of the socialization process. Through coming together, you know, children, young adults learn collaborative working. 
they learn how to, well, in kindergarten, they learn how to share their toys, you know? but that nothing can replace that face-to-face, -face. but we top it up with the technology. You know, the, the, it's just education is so much part of the socialization process, where as they grow, we know this, we know this, young people grow into being, you know, both young adults and into adulthood. It's how they learn, in addition to in the family, the rules of social engagement. It's really critical. Um, and of course, a whole school culture can support that. And by whole school culture, I include leadership, uh, professional standards, the teaching learning process, um, policies, compliance, all that kind of thing. Um, and also uh, the community. And we're really talking about social inclusion here and how a whole school culture can foster that. And um, the point I got at the top, which I think is absolutely fundamental, is equity of access. And if you go back to, uh, well, the British Council original aims, it starts off with all young people doesn't matter who they are, where they are, which part of the country they live in, whether they come from a, a wealthy background or not as wealthy, they all, all have equity of access. And the problem with digital only is it's not equitable. You know, but if a family has one computer, my prediction is the boys will have it first. <laughs> So there's a, an, an innate um, challenge of equity. And the final bit, uh, you know, I mean, the economy is global, global mobility. And the, the final thing is this parity of esteem. Parents' influence, every single one of you in this room is an influencer for somebody else. And the, <laughs> the often used quotation is, of course I believe in vocational education, but for other people's children. So we need to shift these mindsets to get the parity of esteem across the board. Uh, moving on. Yeah, so what does this mean? You, as very senior education professionals, are absolutely instrumental. And I I believe this with all my heart. The roles you play can make a difference and change things. Um, you've already demonstrated how you can change things for your current cohort of students. You kept your schools open. You know, I take my hat off to you. You kept the learning happening. You did not compromise on standards. You know, that... that <laughs> That is such an achievement as the world sort of slowly falls apart. But it's also about the future generations. And you have the opportunity, given your positions and roles, to start changing things fundamentally. You're doing it across the board. Um, young people will leave education and hopefully get a job. Are you developing, as part of your career's guidance approach, um, links to employers? I mean, career's guidance is very important, and it, it, it needs to be mandatory, professionalised, internationally benchmarked, um, and it happens. Uh, and this was an area I was working with the National Education Commission on, on revising the National Career's Guidance Policy, the schools and instrumentally also for NGs and unfortunately the pandemic got in the way of making the, the uh, recommendations but it's still vital and this is something each of you can take on board and given your roles, your leadership roles, you can also communicate in all of your engagement with your learners, with their parents about this parity of esteem or progression pathways through your careers guidance or you as professionals, how you work and how your staff go about their uh, delivery of their work, you are role models. 
And so you have the opportunity to demonstrate these principles of equity and fairness. One and a half million children, that is 75% of enrolled students in 140 countries around the globe, have been out of school during this COVID-19 pandemic. Never before have we seen school closures being in effect on such a global scale. But all school closures impacting all learners in the same ways, is COVID-19 increasing social inequality through its impact on education? Here we have a panel of thought education leaders to seek to tackle these questions which you have as we look at the impact of COVID-19 on education. What can be done to mitigate the negative impact of this pandemic on education equity? And what is the means of future of education? I would like to start by an opening question to you all. The COVID-19 pandemic has suddenly and abruptly forced schools and education to engage in a massive digital transformation. In a broad sense, the key stakeholders, the management, the teachers, students, and parents have had changing roles to adjust their transition. How have these roles changed? Is it for the better or the worse? Your thoughts, Dr. Harris? Good evening, everyone. My thoughts uh, are interrupt uh, all this whole uh, episode of what we have gone through last year is that uh, uh, I see two huge advantages for kids. First is, I think we all as educators have realized that technology is an important component in what we do. Every one of us during the last year have advanced in IT in whatever the, the, whatever we, uh, we did. IT comes naturally where children are concerned. And as a result, I think the gap between the teachers and the students have closed, certainly, during this last year. I mean, I was just block watching uh, this famous Sugata Mitra speaking yesterday at a forum. Uh, many of you may, may know, Sugata Mitra did this uh, uh, research back in 2010 in a slum in New Delhi, where he kind of went and fixed computers and provided the computer with connectivity. Now the children living in that area didn't have a clue about computing. In fact, many of them had not even seen a computer. Certainly they didn't know what internet was. So he just fixed this computer and let the children gather and do whatever they did. Within hours, he found that children were getting into the web, the internet. And within a couple of days, two, three days, he found that they communicated amongst themselves and were even downloading games and playing games. Okay, so that's, that comes so naturally with children. So he continues his experiments. But I think as teachers, many of us were a little reluctant and this year has helped us a lot in that. So that's a huge gain that our sector has had over the last year. But the second uh, important thing is that I think we all have to realize that technology is not everything. It's not the solution for everything. I think that also we have realized. After going through this one year, if you ask any child from day group to year 13, they will say, want to get back to school as early as possible. No one is happy having online education. So children themselves have realized that technology is not the solution for everything. That, you know, work deep together, the, the social impact, sports, all that they have lost. In fact, listening to Sudhata Mitra yesterday, he was saying, through his experiments, he was also talking a lot about problem-based learning. He said, the whole thing is about comprehend, communicate, or comprehending and communicating and computing. He says, children should be given problems to solve. They will comprehend what the problem is. And then they will communicate with one another. And they will prove the computers 
by going through the internet or whatever, they find their own solutions. But let us look at it in a different way. Take a team game that we can play, at least what children play. In team games, in sports, isn't that what happens? Okay. In a situation, as a team, they will comprehend the situation. What should we do as a team? Then they will communicate with one another. And they will come up with their own solution. So sports itself does that same thing. And that's also an important component that children missed out. So I think this year has made us realize two important things. Technology is important, very important, but that's not the solution for every problem that we have. Thank you, Dr. Alice. Dr. Price? Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, I think the pandemic, for me, uh, with regards to technology, has made me think that effective teaching is effective teaching anywhere. Um, it can happen in a classroom, and it can also happen online. And technology is a tool to make that happen. It's just a platform. But it doesn't take away the effectiveness and the strategies that we put in place um, to engage our learners, to help our, our students apply their knowledge, and to reinvent, redesign, and augment their learning. Technology, the way that technology, we've been pounced into technology over the past year and a half has just accelerated, for me, this thinking that um, that we need to go past substitution in learning using technology. Technology for a long time has just been consumer for us. We consume technology, whether that's online learning, entertainment, reading, or we've been substituting technology or transposing letters or emails or communication. But what we've had to do over the past year and a half is really redesign our learning so technology can help us create new learnings and new ideas and modify and enhance and redevelop our thinking and our students' thinking. So really, I, I think it's been an opportunity for us, and I, and I think we shouldn't sideline it. I think we should embrace it. And further, we should think about how can we use technology to redefine our contributions to society rather than just consuming it. And I think that's our challenge as educators as we walk forward through this pandemic and onwards, that we need to move beyond substitution and just beyond consuming and redesign um, our learning experiences. But all in all, effective teaching is effective teaching no matter where it happens. And we need to remember that as educators. It's our strategies that we employ that engage our learners. Thank you, Dr. Price. Peter? Thank you very much, Chandra, and uh, good evening to you all. Um, I'd like to take a slightly different take on the subject because I feel that this redefining the classroom has, in fact, little or nothing to do with COVID. Because, you see, um, it has everything to do with a failed and broken education system. And this has been prevalent long before COVID. We have been struggling with this. And, uh, so, so let's, let's, what, what do we get, why do I say it's a broken and failed system? For two reasons. One, it's a system that gets two things wrong. One, the fundamental notion of education. We just throw this word education in there. What is education? Of course, it's Einstein who said education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. What education are we providing our children to train their minds to think? Interesting question to ask. So, that's one. Secondly, our education system is focused on teaching instead of learning. We have this crazy notion that an ounce of teaching will produce an ounce of learning that's furthest from the truth. So, we are not focused on, and, 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 and what is this teaching? Teacher instructs, student uh, 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 memorizes, put to standard testing, and even grades. What do these grades do? They actually are testing how much or well you can memorize and regurgitate. Essentially, essentially, there are exceptions. I'm talking broadly about what this system is all about. And now we all know, or most of us know, 
that the workforce of the future, in fact, IBM PwC had a very big uh, survey of 3,000 executives, and they said the workforce of the future, what are the skills that are needed for pivotal talent? And they said creativity, problem solving, and collaboration. And like Lushana said, uh, Ken Robinson said, oh, apart from nurturing these talents, our school system actually kills the reacting. Don't ask, ask questions, don't talk in class. It's ridiculous. So, um, I mean, so it's not only Sri Lanka, it's a world over that we have this problem. And uh, this is why Richard Feynman, that fantastic physicist, physicist who is a lovely way of saying things, he says instead of making our students memorize facts, schools should teach the students how to understand, think, doubt, and ask questions. They should be made, made open to imagination and creativity. So I think this is the real redefining that we need to do of our fundamental broken education system. Now, COVID has made it worse. Because what we have done is we have taken this broken system and we have put it online. A system that we none of us know anything about. The brain works very differently when you go online. And I wish Dr. Tamara Handy was here and I told Anitra it was a little too late. Uh, a psychologist, and she's in the education system, she's trying to change the world, and, and I was fortunate to listen to a talk on moms, on, you know, moms of the number or something like that, and she spoke about this, but I'll keep it, I'll keep it short. So, uh, you know, the brain doesn't work like this. And uh, we are getting carried away thinking that we are actually, that's why Lewis, with all due respect, I would disagree with you. I would not be so sure that you congratulated everyone and said learning happened I'm not so sure. Schools open, but did learning happen? We have to really ask ourselves. This is what leads to bad systems because we tell ourselves that everything is fine. And we walk around saying, you know, we have classes, our parents are happy, and parents happy, children sit and uh, watch the computer and uh, think that they're studying something. Why do we really need to challenge ourselves? And uh, you know, as we go along, we, we talk about few things. I think that's not there. Thank you, Mike, for a completely it's, it's different perspective. So maybe I'm sure you also have something to say about this. I, I will also bring a different point of view. Totally, I suppose, partially agree with Peter. Uh, I don't think that uh, we have reformed or transformed. I think digital was already there. When I was at British School in 2005, we were trained to teach on interactive boards in 2005. And we are saying that it's here now. It was here long ago. So digitalization was there. It's just that we were not willing to accept it. We were not willing to embrace it. We didn't want to change the way we thought, basically. We were teachers, we were comfortable with the board, the white board gradually. We were comfortable giving directions to children. We were comfortable monkey books. I don't know whether we were really checking to see whether children learn. The tests were mostly for based on trying to figure out whether they memorized half the things whether it was really checking on the fact whether they understood the concepts, whether they could apply the concepts they learned. Things have changed uh, through the time. Through, uh, things have changed with uh, projects coming in. People have tried to put certain things in perspective. But we as teachers, we went online. The last one year we've been teaching online. But if you really ask yourself, did you change your way of teaching? We taught online. Previously we taught in a class. But I see, I have three children. I see the teacher teaching the same old way. Is that what we wanted? So if a child was in a class and if they didn't learn anything, sitting in front of a computer, if the teacher is teaching in the same old style, do you think the child learned anything? So I think it's more about we the mindset changed, the delivery method changed because it was delivered online. But the question is, did we change as educations? 
did we change our way of teaching did we use the resources which were there we said we went online we had a board in front of our phone or of the computer we kept on writing on the board some of us didn't even realize that a child is actually looking at a phone and on a phone how big is the screen just imagine you are thinking of a screen which is about 2 inches by 3 inches 4 inches and there is a child at the uh, on the other end trying to figure out what is that did we make our fonts bigger so that the child saw it did we change it did we think from the child's point of view because at the end of the day we are all educationists because we want the children to learn our jobs are there as long as children learn so if that's the customer of us are we treating the customer right are we doing something child centered or is it still teacher centered even though we like to say that we are teachers with a child centered teaching so that's what i would like to bring in i don't think anything changed it's just that we accepted certain things and we kind of said okay i'll go online but we need to think i feel that we need to think thank you that's a very important question did we change as educators sara your thoughts so first off thank you to chocolate and this is for the invite and i think the left side of this panel is kind of thinking alike cuz i have to agree with what peter and what he says as well um answer no question yes things changed massively but this was long overdue using technology is a must we need to use technology but we need to make sure that the purpose is met like like how analia and uh, peter explained if you are just saying the same thing if you are teaching the same thing over and over again to the students same result right there is no new outcome but if you look at the employment market is it the same jobs that's out there that was there like you know the time when we were studying no right so then the kids need to learn new skills new new things are we giving that to the kids um the four critical skills that uh, peter was talking about collaboration creativity and all of that that is what we need to be teaching our kids now right in school did any teachers or any facilitators include that into the syllabus in the last one year or were they trying to catch up on the syllabus given that there was a delay during lockdown and so on and the second aspect you are asking about other parties right um dr alice was saying kids are waiting to go back to school we as parents we want them to go back to school as well it's, it's terrible managing our work lives plus the children's work life i mean study a school life but one thing i actually noticed i have to completely agree with peter so my my little one is 4 years old in nursery and i sit with her when she does her school and then when the teacher says okay color it in red she wants to color it exactly in red but i would want her to try different colors i want them to think differently think creatively but no exactly what peter said learn to learn to and you are marked on that right fortunately my parents put me through edx education so i know i stood out because of that because i i studied the lockdown syllabus because we are not meant to think that way and and agreeing with what rushana said as well self directed learning that is the norm in the west and in other parts of the world if i am to take my own qualification cma in uh, 2017 because we tied up with the uh, american institute of cpas we brought this thing called the cgma finance leadership program a self directed learning mechanism to learn a professional qualification in your own pace no matter which uh, device you have you could just learn it the way you want i mean you didn't necessarily have to have physical interactions or anything like that but the learning was up to the person the testing and all of that is already in built if we were to try promoting this before 2020 in sri lanka wouldn't have worked it's working now cuz it's just now that everyone's got into the technology aspect 
if uh, I mean my team has done webinars in 2018, 2019, not even the so-called professionals come for those because we are not used to using technology that way. So in in my honest opinion, I'm very happy to see at least now people are using technology to take education forward. But change what you're teaching. That's my really Thank you all. That's a completely different perspective from all. Doctor, this question is to you. With the effects of COVID-19 pandemic, distance learning is occurring for all subjects, including STEM education as well. However, it comes at the price of in-person learning, which gives students the ability to engage in hands-on learning, a necessary step for cognitive development, especially in subjects of science. Has online learning diminished the excitement of STEM subjects usually create in that created in the classroom? How can we overcome these online challenges of teamwork and hands-on learning needed for thriving STEM education in schools? Okay, I think uh, before I get to that, uh, I must say at least something in defense of schools and teachers. <laughs> you expected the teachers to change the system during the last year, working online, I'm sorry you're asking for too much. Systems have to be changed by the administrators, the policy makers. Teachers have to work within a certain framework. I was in this discussion yesterday on another webinar organized by the Computer Society of Sri Lanka. So I was there, and along with me there were two other industries. One was the head of coach who was doing this big apart. And I had a similar conversation. Okay. They say they are not getting what they want. The question that I raised was, how much does the industry invest on education? I told them that before starting our A-level intake, I, we had a program, online again, the last paper. We called it VSAT, for values, skills, attitudes, and knowledge. And one of the speakers was Dr. Vishan, who worked for Vega. And our children enjoyed that work the most. Okay. It was all about, you know, innovative thinking. But industry also has to invest on it. Take our country. Successive governments have projects such as thousand school project, five thousand primary school project, Modamapasar and Nagamapasar. They all talk of buildings, labs. How much do they invest on each of it? On human resource development. As an organization, I'm very happy, I must tell you. My organization is all we we have closed. No online teaching or learning. All our teachers are undergoing professional development. They are going through two programs. One is the Microsoft World Conference, which is called E2. The other one is something called the World Education Summit. If we do not invest on teachers and provide them that exposure, I think the industry is being very unreasonable. And I don't think that happens enough in our country. So that's something professional organizations, industries, you need to identify. I mean, just I remember when my father was a principal, when parents come and complain about teachers, he asked, how many of you want your children to become teachers? Not a single hand goes up. Does it show that you know you need to support all the teachers? We have to. And of course, change in the system has to be done by the so-called pundits or the administrators. And that's where either the industry and the professionals have to get involved and have their say. Okay? So that's something that I must tell defense of all the teachers. About the STEM education. Naturally. I mean nothing can supersede doing anything hands on. Okay? But I'm happy. Even technology has changed. Now people have been working mainly on Microsoft Teams or Google or whatever. Now Teams has really evolved over the last year. They've come up with so many new features. Okay, they have breakout rooms. 
which encourages this group work. Okay. They go into groups, the teacher can visit the groups and they can come back. Okay. Then there is VR, AR, okay, where you know you can really use for technology. I would say it was deep for that matter, even arts. I mean, lots of schools had you know carol services, digital art competition. I think teachers within their limitations, they kind of were very creative in many schools. That is something that we should admire. After all, what are the alternatives there? I mean, we have to understand they could even come to school, many of them. There were some schools on the 12th of March they closed, okay, and for another three or four months they could go to school even to get their books if they wanted. Right? So they, they, they were working on severe constraints. Right? And you must understand, I mean, we are talking about normal schools, but the fact is we all do their study in Karamu schools. Right? And with my experience in working with the STAR schools and the National Education Commission, we have 10,000 schools in Sri Lanka. 1,500 schools have less than 50 students, and another 1,500 have less than 100 students. But what happened? They closed all the schools. Okay. And if social distancing was a problem, those schools, not one meter, they would have 10 meters between children. Okay. There's so many, but, and none of them had any devices, no connectivity. Okay. That's the kind of hardship they had. So, I mean, STEM education, yes, I mean, basically, uh, with the facilities that are available, okay, and with so many new innovations coming, in, you can do it. But I fully agree. Nothing supersedes doing something hands on. Go ahead. I'd just like to add that if the industry may be failing um, education and the educational system, I think we really need to look at universities and what they're doing to K-12 education systems. Because, um, you know, it all, it, when, when you've got a set of criteria that you are asking kids to adhere to at university, the competition becomes very fierce between kids. The pressure from parents for those students to memorize everything and pass those exams and um, apply to universities with the top grades becomes incredibly uh, full of pressures, a pressure cooker. If we change the criteria for how we get into universities, we're going to change the system that we're teaching in because we're going to value critical thinking. We're going to value the contributions that we can make to society as evidence of learning rather than an exam-based piece of evidence that is really doing this for your education, right? So it's about universities coming on board. It's the universities that our stakeholders really care in terms of changing things. And, and we need to get them on board. So very quickly, Harsha, I don't know why you said you need to defend your teachers. Who attacked them? <laughs> <laughs> so don't get us wrong. It's about the education system. In fact, later on, I will talk about the problems teachers face. So I, I don't think there was a need for that. So uh, nobody is attacking uh, teachers. Uh, it's an education I system. Don't say, I don't say you attack. No, no, no. You say defend. Somebody is attacking. <laughs> no, that's the point. The point. See, I'm serious. The thing is, when you talk about the education system, you must not conflate it, uh, confuse it with attack. It's a, it's a criticism of teachers. No, that they have nothing to do with it. In fact, they are they are they are real. They are they are, they are, they are victims of the system. So we come to that later on, I don't want to interrupt the flow, but I, I want to specifically talk about teachers and, and how we are not creating happy teachers. Peter, one, well, the next question is for you. What new roles can it take play in the rapidly growing education industry in the next 10 years? Okay, so I look at technology very differently because, uh, for example, if you're going to... Technology is one thing, but uh, whether we want to so quickly rush in with the technology problem, rather than addressing the problem of the fundamental problem of the purpose of education and the focus on learning versus teaching. You can sit under a tree and teach, tell a story to children much more effective than you know, using technology sometimes. So I think we need to think a lot before we rush in with this idea that technology, you know, so debate is about technology. Forgetting the fundamentals, 
was a problem with the system. That's the danger of this COVID that I saw. Now that we are talking about a completely different thing. So we lost track of this. Changing the fundamentals of what is education, what is teaching, what is learning. So I'm not going to quickly rush where angels might fail to tread on technology. Moving on to where the fundamentals of any education in the school, Dr. Thais. In the primary years, we focus on a lot of students' relationships, whether they be self or those who are around. A child's self-worth for all those which the foundation is laid at early and primary years. Can you recommend how teachers should adapt to promote self-reflection and attain positive behaviors from students during the early and primary years in an online setting. I believe that the only way to do this is becoming really good parent, uh, partners with parents, um, especially in the early years. So if you want to go back to attachment theory and the way we are attached to our children as parents it has a huge impact on their self-worth and how they view themselves as they get older and the relationships in their future. So really, I think for, for, you know, for us as a school and for many schools, we've all had to deal with the anxiety that our parents have faced over this past year and a half of how to deal with our parents even more than how to deal with our students. So you know, I, I think that training our parents, giving them tools of how to work with their students at home is the number one um, way to promote self-worth, to promote positive behaviors, in children at school and partnering. A complete partnership means um, not keeping them out of the classroom when we go back on campus learning. It means not to just only talk to them three times a year when there are conferences. It's to communicate, to build relationships, to partner by showing them how you're teaching certain concepts so they can reinforce those at home. And I bet the, the schools that did very well and those children who did very well during the pandemic already had healthy partnerships with those parents. So they knew what was going on in the classroom, they knew what, was, um, what their children were learning, and they were able to help partner with you as, with your teachers and, and, um, and actualize some of those learning outcomes that were, were needed. Can I, can I take a minute and just respond to the technology? Technology was a hot topic right now. <laughs> but I, I I also think that um, that when I go, I go back to effective teaching is effective teaching anywhere, and it goes back to design, right? So our ability to design really good lessons matters. But I think we get stuck on, and maybe I didn't explain it well earlier, consumption. So the good example that you use in terms of, of um, going online and, and listening to an author describe her or his book may be a, a, a better learning experience than hearing the teacher talk about it. But actually, John Hattie, a researcher in education, says it yields no difference. There's no sizable effect in learning. Whether you listen to that book online, whether you hear the author talk about it online, or whether you're reading that book, you're just substituting it. That's what I mean by the substitution. What changes it is if you as a teacher say, okay, read the book, either way, online using technology or in real life, and then recreate a book of your own using technology and publish it, share it with other students and other families, discuss it, criticize it, debate it, now you're learning something. So it's how you're using the technology, it's, it's the design of the lesson and get away from substitution and away from consumption when it comes to technology and create something new and can contribute to society. That's where it makes a difference. Anyway, I'm just passionate about this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Tai. Since you mentioned about parents, uh, already this is directed to you. Parents as joint educational partners, the role of parents as uh, our partners in educating their children, how can parents and teachers work together to understand the children's needs in education? Interesting question. Since I've been a teacher and a parent, uh, I think I can give both perspectives. Most of you are parents and teachers, so 
uh, in the during this pandemic, a lot of things changed. The way we saw the world changed, basically, or we saw family. So we were all stuck between our walls, and we were interacting with our families, which was at a point getting frustrating. Uh, children were getting frustrated hearing the same voices. Uh, parents were getting tired because uh, there were pay cuts, there were lots of issues, people were trying to meet, get ends to meet. So there were lots of issues that people went through psychologically, teachers as well as parents. Right? And then suddenly you put a person in the deep end and tell them, okay, teach. You have a syllabus. You have an exam that is coming, and a teacher is expected to teach a student a few kilometers away. All of us know how difficult it was to have a student in class and to get them to listen to you for 10 minutes. Right? It's not an easy task. So when they are 5-6 kilometers away, when they had the option of unmuting or turning off their screen, which as uh, Dr. Miss Croucher said, sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, they had the opportunity of doing what they wanted. They took everything to themselves, they decided. So at a situation like that, parents' role and the teachers' role drastically changed. So from a parent's point of view, a lot of things were going on and they were supposed to teach. You and I are trained to teach. A parent is not. So sometimes they are wondering what to teach, how to teach. And being parents, even though I, I was a teacher and a parent, still my daughters wouldn't listen to me. They rather listen to the teacher. Because at the end of the day, at home, I am the mom. No matter how qualified I am, it didn't matter. So they always prefer to listen to the teacher because they trusted them. Not that they didn't trust us, but they knew that they knew how to do it right. right. So with that happening, it was very frustrating for the parents to teach. It, uh, from my experience, what I saw was a whole lesson was done, probably twice or thrice a week and the parents were expected to teach the rest of it and finish the work, which was tiring for the pair. And because of that, the content or what you wanted to teach probably wouldn't have gone into their little minds. I mean, even though it might be an 18 year old, still their little minds, not like you and I. We have that option of choosing to learn. They have a, the option of choosing to do something else, either watch a movie or do something else. The option is there. From a teacher's point of view, suddenly you are put in there, you don't know how to use Teams or Zoom or nothing. Then you don't have the technology or the resources. Some of the teachers wouldn't have had a computer at home. Right? So they had to use a phone. I have seen when my uh, daughter was doing the online class, the screen was turned to the ceiling because the teacher was busy teaching because we are not trained to teach online. So it was a tough task for the teacher also. It wasn't an easy task suddenly doing everything online. So I think as teachers and as parents, we need to understand that both parties are going through a tough time. We can't expect the parents to teach everything and parents being parents, we can't expect the teachers to teach everything too because they are also trying their level best with the uh, resources available and the time available with the syllabus and an exam which hasn't changed at all. The exams are still the same. The teachers have to coach the students to sit for the same exams. But they are not the people who are actually teaching, it's the parent who is teaching at the end of the day. And the school is judged on 
the results of a child who has been taught by parent. So I don't think anything is fair when you look at it in that context, right? But what we need to do is we need to communicate. I think it's all as everybody said. We need to plan when we are doing, especially online. We need to plan what we are doing, and if we can tell the parents, okay, this is what we are going to teach ahead of time. If we have a plan, say, okay, go through these these areas or get your children to watch these YouTube uh, videos. Or get them to read this particular page, then even a parent will be prepared to understand what is taught. Because sometimes it's the fact that we don't know how to help our student that frustrates as a parent. And then for the teachers also, it's frustrating. You keep on telling, you keep on teaching, and the child doesn't understand. It's frustrating for the teacher. So it's the communication, it's the planning that matters. So as partners in education, it's very important that we plan ourselves and educate the person on the other end, also to understand okay what would happen. Because a child is a child, they would try not to learn if they want to, but at the end of the day, all are what the parent and the school wants is for the child to learn. So it's important that we plan and communicate very clearly. Since technology doesn't clear anything, it's humans who have to clear everything. So the instructions have to be given clearly. I think if that communication happens, parents are also willing to learn, willing to work with the schools better. So that's my thought on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Zara. Which stakeholders beyond parents need to be engaged and involved in the return to school? For example, religious leaders, community groups, employers, and influential groups. So I would say community leaders to influencers and especially probably the parents. Because whatever said and done, yes, I said we are eager to send our kids off to school, but. To be honest, when I look back, I feel like it's back to the pre-war days, right? Because this is a virus, and the child could just go contract it at school, contract it somewhere, and come back. So it's, it's the responsibilities of almost all the stakeholders to make sure that the environment is safe, that the parent can rest assured back at home. Because at the end of the day, just imagine, I mean, we've not even given the vaccine to kids under uh, people under 30. So our, it's, it's a vulnerability out there for the kids. So that's that's like a critical element for the administrators to keep in mind to ensure that safety precautions are maintained. And then again, it's the policy makers as well. Probably as much as the administrators of the schools and the parents, it's the policy makers as well. Um, in terms of teachers and management, um, one point that I agree with Dr. Alice is that they, we need to figure out a mechanism to gauge the students when, when they come back to school. Because not all of them would have had access to phones or laptops or even a printer for that matter. I'm not sure how many uh, teachers or heads here would know how many students have printers at home. So they won't necessarily have those things. So you might need to invest time on gauging their performance, giving them time before maybe you schedule an exam of sorts, getting them back up to speed. So a lot of work needs to be done before you just get them back onto the normal school mode. Good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of Shoplab Magazine, Tissel and our sponsors, I would like to thank all of you for gracing this conference with your presence. Every one of you has contributed to the success of this event, even through your participation this evening. And undoubtedly, you will put out to use the insight and knowledge gained here today in your educational institutes and relevant spheres of influence. I would like to thank Tissel and acknowledge their role in ensuring this conference had the right resource personnel, as well as the reach that we had admission for this. Thank you, Kumari. Thank you, Amitra.
My gratitude goes out to our generous sponsors, without whom this event would not have been possible. Lucille, Mr. Khan, and Naini, thank you so much. Seema, Zahara, Vidoshan, thank you for your generous support. And CIM, Anali, thank you so much for coming on board. I hope you will continue to, con to support efforts that seek to create a difference, particularly in areas pertaining to you. I'm grateful to Ms. Louise Couch for accepting our invitation to be the keynote speaker at this event. I believe you all benefited from the insight and valuable information she shared on the post-COVID-19 education and how we must go about redefining it. I would like to also thank Ms. Rukshana Hassan for the instructive presentation and for bringing a new aspect to this conference. Self-directed learning may come to play a very important role in the future as we learn how to navigate through this new normal. My sincere appreciation goes out to our esteemed panelists, Dr. Harsh Adams, Dr. Michelle Kreis, Mr. Peter Yamega, Mr. Sahara Ansari, and Mr. Nadeem Sanayaka. For accepting our invitations and leading the discussion today, thank you, Ms. Alekta, for moderating this discussion. And I would also like to thank BMICH and Ron Renatel for providing the venue and catering for this event. I believe this conference has the potential to serve as a catalyst to change that must transpire in redefining education in our nation. And what you do, both individually and collectively, when you leave this conference, will pave the way to bring about this change. Thank you very much once again for all your presence. I'm very happy to see all of you here today. And we believe that this is just the start, and we are with you. We support you in any endeavors that you have to take to our education and to you. Thank you to my amazing team for doing all the running around and work to make sure this event turned out well. Thank you, and I wish you a pleasant day. Hours and hours in front of the laptops or iPads or even mobile phones. Hours learning online. Parents having to manage work and the children's school work. This is the reality of today. And that's why I am glad to be a part of this session brought to you by Chocolate on redefining classrooms. I'm delighted to speak to the principals, the school heads of various schools about education for the new world. Hello, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here this evening at the conference. Firstly, to see so many fellow professionals in person after a long time of being shut away. Um, but just to, just to listen and hear the, the, the really interesting discussion and debate over the future of education. Redefining classrooms. I think the last year has given us all the opportunity to reflect on what we want from our education system, how we can best uh, contribute to developing a system that will benefit all young people. I think these questions came up before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has accelerated the need for discussion. So key areas that we focused on are, have been on the mental well-being of our young people, but also on the need for clarity of learning outcomes, um, issues of assessment that allow young people to demonstrate the knowledge and skills they've acquired, and the need for ongoing professional development of teachers so they're able to use appropriate methodologies to meet those learning outcomes. But I also think an interesting feature has been the recognition of the role school principals play, and that includes establishing the whole school culture and their role in leadership, um, working with the local community, and obviously ongoing professional development of teachers. So a great experience, and I wish everybody success in going forward in rethinking, reimagining, and redefining education. Thank you. Uh, Redefining Classrooms was held yesterday, and it was an exciting panel discussion, and also we had a keynote address 
plus the presentation by Rukshana. It was complete different views which you got from the panelists plus the audience. And I would like to thank Chocolat and Tissel for organizing this as this is our first physical conference for all in the education industry. And looking forward to having many more and coming out of the new normal. So this forum actually had a whole group of people who are leaders in the education sector. I think it is very important that we bring the leaders to a forum where we discuss issues that we need to face because reality is what, is what matters. Unless we accept reality, we cannot move forward. So this was a very good forum to have the leaders to discuss the way forward so that we can build a better future for our children in the country. Thank you. I was happy to participate at the session organized by Chocolat together with Tissel on redefining classrooms. This year, the past year, has been a very exciting year in many ways. There was a lot of new learning for us as teachers as well as for students. The experiences that we have had, it is very important that we take them forward and make it even better when we get back to school, hopefully next week. Uh, first of all, I want to say it was a wonderful evening and a time for us all to get together, interact and share knowledge. And I would like to thank uh, Chakalat and uh, thank you Tissel also for coming together. The teachers, the heads of schools all needed this uh, event to uh, relearn, unlearn, unlearn, relearn and do the needful for the children who are coming back to school after the COVID and pandemic. And we look forward to organizing many more events making this program a success. It's been a great privilege and pleasure for UCL uh, to partner with Chocolat and Tissel uh, to conduct this uh, very important uh, program, uh, redefining classrooms and getting uh, the teachers, administrators, principals uh, from COVID and uh, online classrooms and uh, lectures uh, to a physical setting here at the BMICH and uh, we believe that this uh, program uh, added a lot of value uh, to the schools, the principals and the teachers. Um, there was a lot of sharing of best practices and uh, learnings uh, from the schools uh, and uh, uh, wonderful perspectives shared by the panel of uh, uh, panel who uh, also brought in different perspectives uh, from uh, education institutes as well as uh, uh, corporate uh, bodies and uh, this uh, I think uh, would have helped uh, the teachers uh, to uh, enhance um, the methods to uh, provide a better learning experience for students and uh, I think it was also uh, an event uh, where we uh, appreciated uh, the great efforts by the teachers uh, during the past year uh, through COVID-19. Naini? Definitely. I cannot agree less with Gihan. It was a great event which I believe gave a lot of privilege for teachers, industry experts, um, principals, all to come together, discuss uh, the future forward redefining classrooms and also to discuss methods uh, how to go forward and uh, you know how to educate kids using what they've past learned during the COVID lockdown and various things so I cannot agree less with Gihan and we being an education institute it has been a, it was a great privilege for us to be with this event today and it was a great success thank you let me also congratulate Michelle and team chocolate for conducting yet another innovative and successful event. This event bringing together all the heads of schools across Sri Lanka has been pretty exceptional. We talked about redefining classrooms, redefining education during a pandemic year, and it has brought us all together to think what matters the most. Education is all about partnerships with schools and families and teachers and students, and together we can make change. Thank you very much to Chocolat and to the, all the schools and the heads of schools and the organizations 
that supported this. It was an, a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Chocolate Magazine. I'm really, really happy to have got the opportunity to work with you all. It has been an amazing experience. And what's really nice to see is that youth uh, being collaborating with uh, schools and universities to make sure that uh, the education is redefined, classrooms are redefined, and gives a lot of hope uh, to a lot of children and teachers and policymakers. Lovely initiative, all the very best. Uh, I was very fortunate to be associated with this event called uh, Redefining Classrooms because I think it's an important subject to talk about, especially after the COVID situation. Uh, people have been really starting to relook at what education is all about today. Uh, but it's not really different from what it was before. The same challenges exist, which is that our schools are focusing on education as a means of learning fact rather than the training of the minds to think, which is what Einstein said it should be. So are we really in our schools teaching our children to be creative, to be problem solving, how to collaborate with each other? These are the essential skills that are needed as we face an uncertain future. So I think we had a very good discussion. The panel discussion was very interesting, different points of view. And I believe that all of us, including myself, we learned a lot today about what does it take to really redefine our classroom so that we can make our students and our teachers and us, all of us relevant as we face this very, very uncertain future that's before us. So today is the day that we had our Redefining Classrooms School Head Conference in partnership with Chisel and we are very happy at the turnout and we are very happy that we are able to have this kind of conference during this time to see what exactly needs to be done in terms of education in the coming months and years. Uh, we thank UCL for partnering with us, we thank CIMA, CIM. Uh, we look forward to having many more discussions like this in the future and we're very happy to partner with TISL for this uh, purpose as well. We'd like to thank everyone who supported us and made this event a reality. Thank you.